Welcome to Prophecy Countdown with author and pastor Kenneth Baer. Join us every week for the latest updates on what the Bible has to say about the events, the characters, and prophetic signs of the return of Jesus Christ and His coming kingdom. Make sure you not only subscribe, but like your favorite episodes and share it with your friends. Now, on with the broadcast. Welcome to Prophecy Count, and I'm Pastor Ken. The title of my message today is number 388, The Fig Tree Generation. And we'll be looking at some very specific, some very specific prophecy by Jesus in the 24th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. Now, as the name of our podcast implies, all of our podcasts typically have a prophecy thread. Since more than 25% of the entire Bible deals with prophecy, it's not unusual to see it as we open the scriptures. Now, I love answering questions related to prophecy, actually any theological questions. If you have a question or an idea for one of our upcoming episodes, just send us an email at prophecycountdownpodcast at gmail.com. Now, so let's go ahead and get to today's question, number 388, the fig tree generation. Today we're going to be looking at a prophecy uh, by none other than Jesus Christ. And this prophecy answers the question of when. When is Jesus returning? When are things spoken of in the Bible going to happen? When is the end? It, it's all about when, 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 when. You know, it's an important question. It really is. This question is probably the most relevant question that we have um, actually every day and at every age. You know, young couples ask, uh, when can they actually afford to buy a house? Uh, when can they take a vacation? Young pregnant mothers, when will they ever have this child or this baby? Uh, young children say, when are we going to get to grandma's, right, as they're riding along in the backseat of the car? So when is one of the questions on our lips nearly every day? It's one of the questions that the disciples asked Jesus. Actually, three whens is what they asked. Let me give you some context, and we'll see if we can unpack this, what Jesus has to say about this fig tree generation. Uh, the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptic gospels, all record this conversation. It's called the Olivet Discourse, so-called because Jesus was speaking to the disciples on the, on the Mount of Olives, or Mount Olivet. Jesus had just remarked that the temple in Jerusalem would be destroyed. Remember that? Not one stone would be left on another. And the apostles then asked him a question. Actually, there are three questions, and they all have to do with the question, when? These three questions are referred to in verse 3 of chapter 24. Tell us, they said, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Now, this first question, uh, when will these things be, um, was actually related to the uh, temple in Jerusalem, which was destroyed, literally destroyed, as Jesus had said, in 70 AD. Now, as Jesus answers these questions put to him, we note that these verses that immediately follow are primarily regarding the last two questions that the disciples asked. They said, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Or let's put it in the vernacular of when. When will we see the signs of your coming and when will be the end of the age? Again, the question is when. Now, Jesus' coming, or the second advent, as it's called, is closely related to the end of the age, and that includes what's known as the Great Tribulation. So let's jump to verse 29, 25 more verses further, in this 24th chapter of Matthew. And many Bibles, your Bible likely, has a paragraph heading that says, the coming of the Son of Man. And we'll see that Jesus, what Jesus has to say in answer to these questions. I'll read uh, beginning there and read through verse 35. Jesus says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the Son of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all of the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect 
from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Okay, so that's the answer to, the, to when Jesus returns physically. And it's also a good answer to the end of the age as well. It's immediately, Jesus says, after the tribulation, a period of seven and a half years, or halfway through that is three and a half, which is then the last half of the, of the tribulation, which is called the great tribulation. Now, this is the second coming. We're not talking about the rapture of the church. We'll talk about that on another day. Now, when, then Jesus continues. Note, this is the prophecy of the fig tree generation. It's actually a parable. It's a very serious parable. Jesus says this. He says, now learn this parable from the fig tree. When the branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all of these things, know that it is near at the door. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. You know, so Jesus gives a prophecy, and the prophecy is related to, of all things, a fig tree. And this teaching is actually a parable. And this is a perfect example of what Jesus said as he told the disciples on why he spoke in parables. He said that the parables reveal the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. You know, in many ways, these parables bring clarity, where otherwise there may be confusion. Now, at the same time, Jesus said that there would be many that would hear this parable, but really not listen. They would hear it, but really not listen, and therefore they would not understand. So let's talk about this parable, the lesson of the fig tree. This was Jesus' response, remember. The context is Jesus is responding to two when questions. What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And there are actually two particular instances in the New Testament where Jesus spoke, speaks of a fig tree. We can also pull a couple from the Old Testament, but we'll just work on these two from Jesus. Jesus speaks of a fig tree that can provide us with some assistance in understanding this parable. The first is the rather interesting and short account of the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11, where Jesus actually curses a fig tree that had leaves but no fruit. And the fig tree completely withered up the next day. The second is a parable that Jesus tells about a man who had a barren fig tree. And this is, this is quite important. Uh, for three years. This is out of the Gospel of Luke chapter 13. This is what Jesus says. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And it came, he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of the vineyard, look, for three years I have been seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, sir, let it alone this year again until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well, but if not, after that you can cut it down. You know, both of the accounts that Jesus spoke of of the fig tree speaks of the unfruitfulness of the people of Israel, the chosen people. For three years, remember, Jesus ministered to the people. He performed miracles. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. What happened? The religious leaders rejected him. They were completely unfruitful. Jesus even used the three years as a reference to this parable in the Gospel of Luke. It was three years that Jesus ministered. The parable of the fig tree in Matthew 24 is a direct reference to Israel. You can underline that in your Bible, and you got to get it. You have to understand that. If you don't understand the importance of Israel in Bible prophecy, you will never understand prophecy. So here's a really good example that the fig tree is speaking of Israel, both the people as well as the land of Israel. Now notice, in this fig tree generation prophecy, it's sandwiched between two of the most referenced prophecies in the New Testament, the prophecy of the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and that's found in Matthew 24. Jesus gives us the exact timing of this event. As he begins the section, he says, that we just quoted, he says, immediately after the tribulation of those days. 
So then Jesus gives this fig fig tree uh, parable. So we know that Jesus is speaking specifically of his second coming to happen immediately following the tribulation of those days. Uh, Now, it's obvious that Jesus is giving an indication of when these last day events may happen. It has to do with Israel. Now, we all understand seasons. We, we really do. When, you know, when you're young, you understand that there are four seasons, right? We understand that we're fall and winter and spring and summer. It's one of the first lessons you learn probably in kindergarten or in first grade. You know, I live now in Florida, and we've noticed that these seasons, they tend to run together. It's kind of difficult to tell the difference between summer, spring, and fall. They're all pretty much the same. Uh, but that's not true up north. You know, uh, in my home state of Michigan, uh, the state my family calls home, we say that there are two seasons. Uh, We have winter and the 4th of July weekend. And that's just a joke. It's a silly joke. Uh, But the idea is this, is that we all, regardless of where we grow up, we all know the signs attached to the seasons. For example, one of the first indications of spring is the appearance of lilies and crocuses, but sometimes they'll poke through the snow even, and we saw that in Michigan. Both lilies and crocuses have a very early bloom time, and they are considered the first signs of spring. Now, in the same way, the fig tree, when the branch becomes tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. This is what the parable says. Jesus is not giving us a lesson on horticulture. That's not at all. This is a spiritual lesson. Um, but he's speaking certainly of his coming because he's answering the question that the apostles raised. Tell us about the time of your coming. Now, just as the fig tree puts forth leaves, you know that the summer is near. As the fig tree is a symbol of Israel, The fig tree putting forth leaves is a metaphor for the last days. Israel will again be in the land and begin begin to put forth leaves. Its branches will become tender, and we see that the fig tree is alive. You know, often trees during the winter, they look dead. You wonder whether there's any life of them. But then the spring comes, and they get tender, and they start budding, and they have leaves. And you know that summer is near. Now, Jesus is not alone in prophesying that Israel will be regathered in the end end days. There's a number of prophecies in the Old Testament um, about the righteous reign of the Messiah, and it will be fulfilled literally in Israel. Isaiah said that the dispersed of Judah will be gathered from the four corners of the earth. Uh, The prophet Ezekiel, which I love quoting in chapter 37, says, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come out from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. This is a prophecy of the regathering of Israel in the end times. Jesus said very clearly that the regathering of the Jews in Israel would be a sign of his second coming and the end of the age. Now, what's important to understand is that for hundreds of years, <laughs> nearly two millennium, the church, the learned theologians, the scholars, and the priests never truly considered that Israel would ever become a nation again. You know, as a result, the prophecies of Daniel and Jesus and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Hosea were never taken literally. The church said they must be taken figuratively because, of course, God is done with Israel. Well, the Jewish people were thought to have rejected the Messiah, and so the church taught that God had broken his covenant with Israel. But you see, that's not true. God will never break his promise. God cannot lie. It's impossible for him to do that. He will not break his promise. In the past few hundred years, Bible scholars have begun to look again at the Bible and take what it says literally. As we're getting closer to the end times, scholars have turned again to the Bible and said, maybe we should take a second look. Now, initially, It's true that there was a very small minority of people that took a look at the regathering of Israel and this this prophecy I'm talking about today, trying to take it literally. But those many, many, many more believed that the Jews would be gathered back into Jerusalem at the end times and their scholarship began to be taken seriously. 
Then what happened? Well, what was thought to be impossible actually happened. Uh, nearly after two millennia, we witnessed the rebirth of Israel. On May 14th, and today is May 14th, by the way, May 14th, 1948, David Ben-Gurion, the chairman of the Jewish Agency for Palestine, announced the formation of the State of Israel. And Ben-Gurion became the first prime minister of Israel. 1900 years after the temple had been destroyed and the Jews had been, dis been dispersed all throughout the world, the nation of Israel lives again. Israel was reborn in a day just as the prophet Isaiah had prophesied. So let's finish up and take a look at this prophecy again and pay particular attention to verse 24. Jesus says, now learn this parable from the fig tree when the branch has already become tender and put forth leaves, you know that summer is near. That's verse 32, by the way. That was Israel. So also when you see all these things, know that it is near at the door. Okay, this Jesus is tying his coming to this this, this fig tree, it's at the end times. Then Jesus concludes with this, verse 34. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. This generation doesn't mean the generation that was listening to this when Jesus said it. He said, no, look to the fig tree. When you see the fig tree in bloom, when you see Israel back in the land, then these things will begin to happen, and it's that generation that will not pass away. Now, if you have any, my friends, if you have any interest in prophecy at all, you should be actually jumping up and down. Jesus is giving us a very clear timeline of his second coming, and it's tied to Israel in the land. Who is the fig tree? Israel. Israel. Its branch became tender and began to sprout leaves when the Jewish settlers began to resettle in this ancient land of promise. Clearly, the official birth of Israel as a nation is May 14th, 1948. Now, this date is likely a key date. If we're trying to figure out when the generation starts, 1948 may be a key date. Now, many people remember the Six-Day War in 1967. That's an important date also because Israel reclaimed Jerusalem. Uh, Israel was not in charge of Jerusalem until 1967. Now, any time before 1948, there was the excuse that this prophecy I just gave you, this parable of the fig tree, is just talking about uh, an allegory. It's just, a, it's just a metaphor for something else. We don't know if that's Israel. We don't know what it's talking about. Maybe it's some guy named Moshe that's planting a, fin a, a vineyard somewhere. But no, 1,900 years later, when Israel is reborn in a day, we all of a sudden take a look at this prophecy. We say, now, wait a minute. We've got to take this literally. We have to understand that this is Israel. Now, more and more today, scholars, students, pastors, even casual readers of Bible prophecy wonder what Jesus meant when he said, this generation will not pass away. You see, there's some challenges that we all have when we say, when we take a look at the word generation. First of all, how long is a generation? And secondly, when does this clock start ticking? Was it 1948? Was it 1967? Is there a different date? So let's take a, let's take a look at the second part of the problem. When does the clock start ticking? See, it's difficult to, to fix a starting date. It, I, it very well could be 1948, and I personally like that date myself. The other date most likely would be 1967, the date that Israel retook Jerusalem. Now, the second issue is what I first brought up, which is how long is a generation? Well, if you remember Hal Lindsey's The Late Great Planet Earth, he said it was 40 years. However, you can look at the Bible and you can see that 70 years is also referenced as a generation and occasionally 100 years. Now, the 100 years is, a, is the longest time frame in the Bible referenced as a generation, and I like it. And the reason I like it, and that is not just because it's long, but also the context, the context of when um, it, this was in Genesis, uh, when it was talked about a generation being 100 years, is talking about the end times. Listen to this. This is Genesis um, verses 12 through 16. Uh, this is the 15th chapter of Genesis. 
The Bible reads, Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not yet theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them for four hundred years. Get that? Four hundred years. Also, the nation for whom you, I serve as a judge, afterwards they will come out with a great possession. It's talking about the Exodus. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. So in this, these verses I just read, it said 400 years, and it said the fourth generation, meaning that 100 years is a generation. And again, this is speaking about Israel in the land. So again, I like this time frame because of the context of Israel coming back into the land, just as God had promised Abram, who became Abraham, and of course that was fulfilled by Jacob and his 12 sons when they traveled to Egypt were there for four generations and then came back into the promised land. Um, the Israelites in the fourth generation left Egypt. It's recorded in the book of Exodus. Okay, my friends, so what do we learn? Well, we learn that this, this parable is actually a prophecy that Israel is back in the land. We know that Israel is back in the land as of 1948. And just prior to telling this parable, Jesus said, now, when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. My friends, Jesus is coming back. It's going to happen. I guarantee it by the word of the, of the, of the scriptures. You have that guarantee. Jesus is coming back soon. And I believe our job is to raise up our heads and look up because our redemption is near. Let's pray. So Father God, we want to thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to know a little. Nearly every day, it's common to see, read, or hear something about the end of the world, the apocalypse, or end times. Author and pastor Kenneth Fair's The Apocalypse and Coming Kingdom zooms in and breaks down biblical prophecy as it relates to Jesus' imminent return and the coming seven-year period, including the Great Tribulation. Available in both paperback and Kindle versions. Get your copy on Amazon or at Barnes & Noble and select Christian bookstores. The title again is The Apocalypse and Coming Kingdom. You can also find it listed by author Kenneth Baer. Get your copy today. Thank you for joining us on Prophecy Countdown with Pastor Ken Bear. Don't leave without first sharing the latest episode with your friends. Be sure to join us again for the latest updates on Prophecy Countdown.